Oh, there it is! What? Totally got that. Uh, isn't that crazy looking? That so gnarly. It did not bite me, but boy, did it make me jump. Does the worm feel any different when it does that? Yeah, I can feel its body like tense up. There it goes again. Oh, there it is! Ugh. What's it doing? It's puking all over me. Ah, uh, uh, gross. Oh, it stinks. Oh yeah, it does. Oh man, gross. In most areas around the world, when the ocean tides recede, they reveal a hidden coastline that is made up of shallow intertidal pools, many of which are filled with colorful plants and bizarre looking marine creatures. However, when the tide pulls back from the inlets and estuaries around Harpswell, Maine, you are often left with an endless expanse of mudflats. These exposed layers are formed when mud is deposited by the tide, and while they may look like a barren wasteland, they usually support a large population of wildlife. Today, the Brave Wilderness team will be joined in the field by Anthony, who is a professional licensed bloodworm digger. For nearly 40 years, he has been raking the mud flats of Maine, and on a good day, he can haul in around a thousand worms. All right, guys, so we have multiple cameras going today, and as you can see, it is still raining. Not too bad right now, but it's gonna be a slightly gritty episode, which is perfect because today we are looking for blood worms. It's gonna be muddy, it's gonna be grimy, and if we're lucky, we're gonna find some of these worms that are then probably gonna end up biting me. Isn't that right? That's right. Okay, well, we're gonna leave the big cameras behind, and what we have here, check this out. This Whoa. is a blood worm digging rake, and as I understand it, you kind of slam that into the yep. dirt and mud, yep. pull it back. Well, yep, pull it back, flip it over. Just, they say it's all in the wrist. All in the wrist, yes. okay. Now you're coming, right? You're not just gonna stand underneath the edge of the car? Uh, I mean, I could stay back here. No, 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 no. I can see that you've got your, yeah. your water shoes on. We're yeah. all getting muddy today. We're all getting in it. All right, guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Yep. Digging in mud flats is truly a dirty job. And believe it or not, Bloodworming is a huge part of Maine's fishing economy as these marine worms are sold as bait. So whether you are catching the prized bloodworm or the slightly bigger sandworm, a heavy haul can equate to a pretty nice paycheck. However, the good news for any and all worms we catch today is that they will be released back into the wild. Now it's just a matter of getting into the mud so we can start digging. Well, you just let us know what you think the best spot is to start digging. Uh, see, no one knows. No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> it's tough. It's like you're walking on another planet. It's crazy looking out here. It's all kind of glassy looking. And this is every day for you, huh? Every day, Rob. Every day. Yep. How you doing, Mario? I don't know. It's a little intimidating. I feel like I'm gonna just like sink in. This is cool. I've never walked through anything like this before. Oh, I fell. Uh, oh my gosh. I thought you're used to this stuff being from the Everglades. Uh, we don't have this in the Everglades. You want to wash your hand by? Yeah. Thanks. Just wash your hand with water. Just wash it around. There you go. There you go. There you go. A little better? All right. That's a little better. Yeah, I have to keep. Hey, you need dry hands? No, no, right. I'm serious. I'm serious. No, I'm serious, but I go through this all the time. You wait. You're good. You're good. Okay, so guys, check this out. Hey, Anthony, I see there's like a bit of a waterway going through here. Yeah. yeah. What sort of area are we looking for to start digging? What? I mean, look at, oh, look at this. It's smooth mud. Is that worm? Are these worm, worm trails? No, that, that looks like, um. Oh, this. Yeah. It's a. Uh, a snail? That's snail. a snail. Yeah. That's a snail. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so not worm trails. Well, I think this little area here looks like a good place to maybe start. Sure. Why don't you sure. show me exactly what the method is for digging? Ready? Yeah. Oh wow, it just peeled back like that. Oh, there's a little worm. No, there's that stick. No. Oh, it's heavy. See how this goes? Wow, it just peels back. It's like cake. Like 
Oh, ooh, ooh. I thought I saw one. Oh, what's that? Is that a tapeworm? Or is that's that... a tapeworm. That's a tapeworm. Yeah, but they go. That's oh, not what... my goodness. That's not what we're looking for. That's a tapeworm. That's a tapeworm. Don't get that in your stomach. All right, we're going to toss him back there in mud. So... Gross. Ooh, stuck to me. Nope. This is like throwing five pound weights. Every lump of mud is about five pounds. That's five pounds right there. And Anthony is just throwing globs of mud effortlessly. Let me tell you who you don't want to get in an arm wrestling competition with. <laughs> Anthony. He's got Popeye forearms. It's crazy. It's tough because you step and you sink. You try to move fast enough so that your feet don't sink. See like that? You ready? <sighs> Winded, man. That is tough. That is a lot tougher than you guys could possibly imagine. The mud is extremely heavy. And as it pulls your legs down into it, you're trying to balance with your feet. My toes actually hurt from trying to keep myself webbed on top of the mud surface as you sink down. And there's nowhere to rest. It's not like I could just lay down in this mud. Well, I could, but then the environment would swallow me alive. I'm sweating bullets right now. Okay. Let's follow Anthony. We can't keep up with him. Come on, try right here. Oh, oh what's up? Oh, something big. Get it. It's not a blood worm. Is that a sandworm? Whoa, look at that. That's a beaster right there. But I don't know if it's a blood worm. I don't see its head coming out. Ooh, I'm putting it in the bucket either way. You got a big one. We're on him. We found the sweet spot. It's the honey hole. Let me see. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> that's what I've been doing yeah. every day. Yeah. What do you got? Let me see. Yeah, that's Whoa! Me. That's crazy. That's, that's what I dig every day, worms like that. Woo! Oh, yeah. Look at its that proboscis is. coming out. Whoa! <laughs> Big yeah! Alien, oh isn't it? God. You can see Anthony's excited. Yeah. That means this is a good worm right here. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Woo! We've got four fangs. All right. All right, we are getting closer to the honey hole. Yeah. I'm gonna put this beast yeah. in the bucket. Show Anthony what we found. Oh, okay. that's a sandworm. That's a sandworm. That's a sandworm. They bite too. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least we found a big one. Woo! Hey, so mighty old. Blood worming on the coast, of Maine. Blood. Oh, there's a good one. You got one. You got one? Yes. Oh, that's a good oh, one. Oh, oh, it's a big one. Oh man! Yes! yes. Hey, got, one. Yeah, yeah. got one! See my blood worm and song brought him up in the mud. Woo! A little muddy, but it finally paid off. I have slung probably 150 globs of mud, and I finally whoa! Don't drop me! Finally found my first keepable blood worm. All right, let me put it into the bucket. Nice. Ready? We got okay. it. All right. We got blood worms. We have a sandworm. At this point, I say we head back to a controlled situation and get these worms up close for the cameras. Woo! This was awesome. Oh man, I'm stuck in the mud. Nice. Mm. All right, guys. So we're back at base camp, and what I have here are two buckets. One that is filled with worms and another that just has some salt water. What I'm going to have to do is dig through all this gloppy mud that's filled with blood worms, rinse them off, and then place them into this clear container so that we can actually see them. You see, look in there. Oh, there's the big, oh, there's one of our big worms there. Okay. Is this salt water right here? Yes, this is salt water. This is a marine species of worm, which means that they live in salt water. If I were to actually put these worms in fresh water, it would kill them. So we do need to be rather gentle with them. Oh, there's a big one right there. Oh, that is, oh, that's one of the big, look at this. That's one of the big ones right there. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that could give you a good bite. All right, get in there, buddy. Okay, I'm gonna move this bucket off of here. So get rid of the water bucket. And now we're gonna get up close with these worms. Now we do have a pretty decent size ragworm here. Anthony also called these sandworms. You see that? I think it's crazy looking. Right, look at the iridescence to its skin. And you can see, if you zoom in there, all these little legs on the side, those are called parapodia. 
and that actually helps these marine worms not only swim, but also burrow. And this also will get extremely long, but that's about its most shrunken up state right there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put this one back into the mud bucket. Crazy. Ooh, what do we have next? Man, the moment we've been waiting for, the blood worm which is exactly what we are going out after today. I wasn't even aware that we would find other marine worm species. And we got a whole container full of them. Um, now, I'm gonna just dump the whole thing into my hand. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. Just so we can see what that looks like. What? Oh. God, they really look a lot like earthworms. Do they smell or anything? They smell like mud absolutely smell like mud and like most worms they'll just kind of stay completely limp in your hand like that and oh i can feel them moving they don't seem to move as fast as an earthworm no all right i'm gonna just kind of single out the biggest ones and you may be wondering to yourselves oh it's put out that one's put on its mouth oh that is a rather big one okay there are one two three four five really good sized blood worms, but I think the biggest are these two right here in the middle. So we're gonna pare this down. I'm trying to let them get comfortable and expand out. I also wanna see if there's one that's going to perform for us with what we're all waiting to see, which is that weird alien looking head that they shoot out of the think, front of their face. I think face. that one, that one you just This touched. one right that there. That seems to be the most lively. Yeah, that one also seems to be the the largest in diameter. All right, we're gonna put these back. Now, one thing that I must note up front, I'm not going to intentionally try to be bitten by this worm, but this is one of the only venomous worm species oh, in the oh, world. There, right there, you see that? You see the head come out? They have a proboscis that they shoot out of the front of their head, which has four fangs. Those fangs, are made of copper and they're like this, right? It's like a grappling hook. Hold up, hold up. Like metal? Like metal, like the element copper. And those- So it has metal teeth. It has metal teeth. Like a Bond villain. Like a Bond villain. You got it, yes. This is like one of the most bizarre creatures. I didn't even know these things existed until we got here to Maine and somebody said, you wanna go looking for blood worms? And sure enough, this is that creature. Now this worm, is a predator and when they're out hunting they'll kind of slink through the mud and they're searching for crustaceans or small invertebrates and they shoot this grappling hook type head out of their proboscis four fangs dig in and then with those fangs they inject venom that venom paralyzes and sometimes even stops the heart of its victim and then they sit there and slurp up the innards like a slushy. now okay this is really cool you see how it's completely slinked out like this notice that coloration you see how purple it is? Yeah. It's all peach colored here and purple here. That's why they're called blood worms because their insides are actually dark red and the skin is semi-translucent and you can see that coloration right through there. Wow, that's cool. You can see like little bubbles running through the body. Yeah, isn't that wild? Look down the side of its body there. You see how it looks like those spikes coming off? Looks like hairs. Yeah, those are heropodia. They're like little feet that help this creature to burrow and also to keep its balance if it's in deep water. All right, we gotta get that proboscis to come out. Let me see here. I'm gonna kinda just lay the worm out in my hand here like this. And you can see, look, it's kinda curling around, probably protecting itself. Can you see that little nodule up front there? What is that? That's a sensory organ. It's a little tentacle and that's how this creature explores its environment. It can sense chemicals in the water with that little front appendage. Look at up here, you see all that purplish coloration? Oh yeah. And it has a lateral line that runs down the length of his body. See that real distinct purple line? That's how you can easily identify this as a blood worm. Ah! Oh! Oh, it went for my thumb, did you see that? Totally got that. It did not bite me, but boy, did it make me jump. Wow, it shoots it out really fast. Wow, there it is. Whoa. What? Oh, isn't that crazy looking? That so gnarly. I think this one's fangs are just too small. Like it's coming all the way out. I see them. I mean, the fangs are pretty tiny, so I don't think I'm gonna get bitten by this thing. Ugh. What's it doing? 
It's puking all over me. Ah! Ah! Gross! Oh, it stinks. Does it? Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. Oh man, gross! Ah! Oh, disgusting! Oh my gosh, did you film all that? I got all of it. Let me see. Ugh. Everything poops on you. Oh my gosh, even blood worms poop on me. Oh, look how long its body is when it's slinked out like that. And just like an earthworm, if this marine creature is cut in any area above pretty much this line right here, it can regrow parts of its body. Look at that, you can actually see the colors going through its body. Woo! Did you try to bite me there? I think it's thinking about it. Show me your proboscis. Ow! Oh. Yay! Did it bite you? He got me! <laughs> I got that! He got me, I oh. felt it, it was oh, a little dude. pinch. Let me see. Where'd he get you? Right there, right in the crux of my finger. It was like a little pinprick. Ah! <laughs> Does it hurt? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It kind of itches, actually. <laughs> yeah, did you see that? You think yeah. you got that? Oh, I know I got it. Oh, man. You just kind of whooped around and nailed me. <sighs> well, okay, I was successfully bitten by the blood worm. Definitely not as bad as a bee sting. Although, you know, if it was significantly bigger, it may have hurt more, but ah, it kind of itches a little bit. Like a little mosquito bite? Yeah, kind of like it, it startled me more than anything, but I could definitely feel it. <laughs> My heart's racing. Yeah, I, <laughs> I even saw I, you I, guys jump back. You're not touching the. Uh, no, no, no. no. I mean, it did, really didn't hurt, but it was it was a prick. It definitely shot me backward. That was funny. Hey, coyote. Yeah. You're right. I'm all right, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was definitely one very wet very muddy afternoon, but we finally came across a whole bunch of blood worms. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Ready to put them back out in the ocean? Let's do it. Sure you don't want to get bitten? Uh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> At the start of this episode, I honestly had no idea what to expect when it came to digging in the mud for worms. But here's what I learned. First, it's incredibly difficult, not only to walk across the mud flats, but also to dig in the heavy, wet mud. Second, it's muddy, in case that wasn't completely obvious. And third, it's actually a lot of fun like looking for a needle in a haystack, or in this case, a bloodworm in a mud flat. There we go. That's a pretty good sized one right there. Nice. I'd say about as big as we found today. All right, guys, time to let the bloodworms and the sandworm back off into the ocean. Now you can release these creatures absolutely anywhere. They live up and down the coast. So this isn't exactly where I found them, but it doesn't matter because they're constantly on the move. They are nomadic, always searching for something new to eat. Maine's bloodworm industry continues to flourish and it's responsible conservation conscious diggers like Anthony who are helping to keep the population of these bizarre looking animals growing. By only taking market sized worms and returning the females and juveniles to the flats, his harvesting methods will ensure a bountiful population for generations to come. If there is one ecosystem on the planet that is constantly changing, it has to be the tide pools. With every single rising and falling of the tide, New waves crash upon the rocks and alter the placement of plants and animals. Along the coast of California, there are a slew of creatures that you can find if you know exactly where to look. Got a little striped crab right here. Oh, got it. There's definitely no shortage of crabs out here in these tide pools. However, navigating this terrain can be difficult because most of the rocks are wet and slippery. But one of the toughest things so far for me and filming beyond the tide has been the terrain. And I'm used to swamps and deserts. Everything here is rocky and slippery. It's all covered in a layer of, I guess it's some sort of algae, and using a lot of eye foot coordination because I'm looking for creatures and every step I take, your foot might slip off of something and these rocks are extremely jagged. 
really easy to get hurt out here. And I'm sure for you, Mark, it's even more difficult. Right now you're balancing on these rocks just trying to get the shots. Yep. I'm sure everybody at home. <laughs> it isn't easy, is it? Nope. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep going this way and see what we can find. Watch your footing. Oh, yep, see, there you go. I'm usually pretty good at finding animals in the field, but sometimes a wildlife expert joins us to help locate the species that can be very difficult to find. Today I'm back out with Thai pool expert Aaron Sanchez, who has been exploring these Southern California pools his entire life. And our goal is to locate a giant sea slug. All right, Aaron, so we're here at the tide pools and we're looking for slugs. What should I be keeping my eye out for? Well, Cody, these slugs are gonna be pretty hard to miss. They're actually the largest sea slug on the planet. They come to these rocky shores here to mate and lay their eggs. Okay, now when you say the largest, do you mean like five to six inches in length or are we talking bigger? We're talking probably almost a little bit less than three feet. A three foot slug? So it's gonna be pretty hard to miss. Yeah. All right, well, let's start searching. The search was on and I was confident that I could come across one of these giants. I mean, if they're as big as Aaron says they are, spotting one should be simple, right? Hi, we've been searching for about 45 minutes now through all these layered rocks. I don't know, Aaron said it was gonna be easy. Nothing yet. We continued to search over jagged outcrops, in crevices, through knee-deep pools, and even under rocks. I'd say the odds of finding one of these slugs are slim to none. Tide's really coming in. Yeah, it's coming in big time, and all I've seen is crabs, crabs, crabs. Hermit crabs, striped crabs, purple shore crabs. No giant slugs. With the tide starting to come back in, it was looking like our search for the giant sea slug was coming to an end. But if anyone knows how to find a sea creature, it's definitely Aaron. Searching, searching. Big slugs. Yeah! Oh, you got one? Come on, come on, come on. Right over here, guys. It's you. Oh my gosh, look at the size of that thing. Wow! Dude! Wow. Yes! Well, that was one heck of a search. And there it is. Can I pick it up? You can't. It's totally safe. And it's not gonna ink me. It might be a little slimy, but that's it. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, is it slimy. Oh, look at that slug. Oh my gosh, it is heavy. Jeez, this thing must be about almost 10 pounds, I would guess. Is that a big one, Aaron? Oh, it's a pretty good size, yeah. It's one of the bigger ones I've seen. Wow. I'm gonna let it stretch out of my arm, see if we can get it to fully elongate itself. Oh my gosh, it is so slimy. All right, now tell us about this slug, Aaron. Well, Coyote, what he's wrapping around your arm right now is actually his muscular foot uses that to get around. I can feel him gripping onto my arm. I mean, I can feel him actually like wrapping around me and I can feel his little tongue under there. He can't bite, right? No, these guys are vegetarians. They mostly eat algae and kelp. And it does have an internal shell, correct? Where um, it has all of its organs? It does have an internal shell. It's kind of soft and made of protein. Okay. And that is actually what these extensions of its foot called parapodia are protecting. I can see why there's no way you would miss stumbling upon one of these. I have to admit, I was just over there talking to Mark. I literally said, I'm really doubting our chances of finding <laughs> one of these slugs. All we've seen all day is crabs and smaller little brown sea hares. Which by the way, we should grab one of those. Isn't there one over here? Let's see him next to each other. Yeah. All right, you got one of those brown sea hairs? Okay, so this is, this is cool, showing the comparison of the giant black sea slug next to the much smaller brown sea slug. And they're both called sea hairs, because as you can see, those tentacles sticking up in the air, in the front of the head, look like rabbit's ears. I thought the brown sea hair was big. <laughs> yeah, seriously, there is no mistaking the difference between these two species. Wow, that thing is absolutely massive. It weighs about 10 pounds, and fully stretched out, it's about two feet in length. That is crazy, and it is so unbelievably slippery. It's actually really hard to hold on to it, and my hands and arms right now are covered in a slippery mucus. Now, are they toxic in any way? No, they're not. Okay, so I'm in no danger right now. So they don't bite, they're not toxic, they're just slimy and alien looking. So how do these defend themselves against predators? Well, you know, these guys don't have as many predators as the California sea hare, probably due to their size. Okay. So they would generally just kind of stick to where they are, and they're going to be pretty well hidden in these rocks. I can't even imagine what would want to try to eat this. 
man, it's just so amazing how big this slug is. When you said to me, yeah, we're gonna go out, we're gonna catch a giant slug, I honestly didn't believe you when you said they could grow to be about two feet in length. And until I actually had this animal in my hand, really on my arm, I didn't believe it. This is absolutely amazing. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for having us out today to explore the tide pools here in San Pedro. I think there's no question about it, this is one big black slug. I'm Coyote Peterson, be brave, stay wild, we'll see you on the next adventure. We gently placed these two slimy slugs back into their respective pools and watched as they slowly returned to the wild. I think it's fair to say that these creatures are as primordial as it gets. And while they may be incredibly bizarre looking, they are an important part of the tide pool ecosystem. Over the years, we have featured a plethora of frog species. Some of them were tiny and poisonous. Some of them jumped on my face. Some of them were giant and screamy. There it is, the famous sound that they meow, make. Meow, meow, meow. Wow! And some of them were even semi-transparent. The point is that I was able to safely catch and successfully get them up close for the cameras so we could learn about what makes them so unique. But what if I told you that there was a frog that was impossible to catch and was also blue? <coughs> Hold up, a blue frog? Yes, you heard me right, a blue frog. This encounter happened on the island of Middle Bass, located in Lake Erie. The following series of events will play out in chronological order. Prepare yourselves because you are about to witness the unbelievable. Oh my gosh. What? Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. I've actually read about this before. This is insanely rare. Every once in a while, based on limitations within genetic dynamics, a frog will sometimes lose pigmentation through its genetic line and will be blue in coloration. I mean, we are talking about a literal unicorn right here. This is crazy. Oh, he moved. There he is, there he is. I still see him. Oh, he can't, he can't make it through there. Oh, whoa. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Maybe he'll come back this way. Still see him? No. Dude, that was crazy. That was crazy. Okay, hold on, I'm coming back to you. I think we need to come back at night. If we come back at night and we see that frog, I can spot mm. it with a flashlight and I don't think it'll jump. I couldn't even get close. Okay. If we can catch that frog. Holy cow, that will be insane. A blue frog. I cannot believe what I just saw. If he comes back out at night, we're definitely gonna get him. Let's do it. So how do you catch the uncatchable frog? I'm gonna build a contraption. Well, when I chased after this frog, the first thing it did was hop across all the duckweed and disappear back Whoa. and into the swamp. And I've got this long wooden beam and I'm going to secure my net to the beam. If I don't have to touch the water, even better. Now bullfrogs have a tendency to breed pretty territorial. So I think even though the fact that I chased it back into the marsh, it's still going to return to that spot to defend its little claim right there. That is good and secure and will give me several more feet of reach. All right, guys, this is it. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay, guys, sun has set. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay, it's just down the way here. Let's uh, sneak up and see if it's back in its spot. There he is. Okay. Right there, he's way closer to me. Oh, shoot. Okay, this frog is definitely tough to catch. Definitely knows what we're on to him. Oh! Don't do it by hand. It's gonna be slippy. Use the net. Put it right under him. Oh! Okay, okay, you could go from behind. 
Hang on, let me get the light on him. There he goes, there he goes, right there, right there, right there. He's, he's going. Still there. Still there. I gotta go on the other side of that fence. Okay. I think we're gonna get him. The length of the net is now actually hurting me. Oh, 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 oh. I see him. No. No. Dang it. Gosh, he's way back in there. Did we lose him? I lost him. Dang it! It was literally inches from my hand, right here. I should have gone for the hand catch, man. I should have gone for the hand catch. Dude, he's all the way back here in those reeds. I can't get him. Oh, but, but, here's the thing. We tried to catch him in daylight. He went all the way back there and came all the way right back to this spot. There's a good chance this frog will be back. I think I gotta catch him by hand. He's too smart for the net. This frog knows exactly what is happening. He's impossible to catch. This is crazy, absolutely crazy. Okay, this is day two. We are back to the spot where the blue bullfrog was spotted yesterday. And this morning it has returned to its territory, which certainly proves my theory that this frog is running this little pocket of water. Now, I can see the frog. I'm not going to try to catch it during daylight. It is way too smart. This may be the smartest frog I've ever encountered. I mean, it was playing cat and mouse with me last night. It was just a game. It led me back into the reeds. I got bitten up by mosquitoes. It was rough. I've never had a more difficult struggle catching a frog. So what we're gonna do is wait until sun gets low in the sky again, just at sunset, when this frog is back in the spot, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna take another attempt. I will attempt with the net at first, but if it gets close, gotta use my hand. Last night, the frog was literally about a foot and a half away from me, and I defaulted to the net. I should have gone with my gut and tried to catch it with my hand and I might have had it, but we're gonna give it one more shot tonight. Okay, here we go. The third attempt at catching the blue bullfrog. And what I've done tonight is brought a smaller net plus the long extended net. Gotta up our chances. And if it's not with the net, it's going to be with my hand. Yes, that's him, that's him, that's him. You ready? Yep. You got him, you got him. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, no, 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 what? No. Oh my gosh, dude, you had him. Hold on, let's rewind and slow it down. Look at the evasive maneuver this frog pulls off as it springs from inside the net and does a full nose dive back into the water and disappears beneath the duckweed. Now look at this, freeze frame, zoom in, my hand is less than an inch away from making a swooping and unbelievable catch. But I missed it. Ah, oh, it was so close. Dude, I had him. I know, I saw him. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that just happened. There's nothing more frustrating than literally having the frog you've been trying to catch for three days in your net and then have it spring out just as I was trying to get my hand in there to keep him locked in position. Oh, don't got him yet, we're gonna keep trying. Is it day three? Day three, attempt number four. four? Mm -hmm. Official attempt number four, the blue frog is back walk over to the car and get the net. Do you guys believe in miracles? Is it possible to catch a blue frog? We're about to find out. This is it. It is our last day. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, sorry. 
already on to us. And that's it. There he goes. All the way back. I don't think we even had a chance. I literally wasn't even able to set foot in the water. The legend of the blue frog. That's it. The blue frog is officially uncatchable. There is a frog that is not capable of being caught by Coyote Peterson. Well, maybe we'll have to return to Middle Bass Island at some point to see if the blue frog still manages to evade capture. I'm Coyote Peterson, be brave, stay wild and impossible to catch. We'll see you on the next adventure. The legend of the blue frog persists. Will we catch Bluey on our next adventure? Stay tuned. You're my boy, Blue. You're my boy. In the summer of 2020, I came upon a sight I never expected to see. Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. For three days, Mario and I pursued this frog. Day and night, we attempted to catch and share this beautiful blue beauty with the coyote pack. Yet this super spring-loaded creature outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and outplayed me like no frog I had ever been witness to. Coyote Peterson was truly defeated by a blue frog. I can't believe that just happened. I returned to the scene of my defeat several times in the following weeks, but the blue frog was nowhere to be found. The phantom of middle bass had disappeared and the legend was born. Then on a random trip back to the island without any expectation of seeing this legendary frog and with no proper camera team, a new blue was spotted and I totally redeemed myself. Okay guys, so here's what's happened. Last night, I was out investigating the same swamp where I had seen a bullfrog once before, a blue bullfrog. You may remember an episode from a few weeks ago called Blue Frog Must See It to Believe It. Well, I didn't anticipate seeing that frog again considering I had scouted one other time. I was back last night and lo and behold, I found a different blue frog. No, this is not the same blue frog that evaded capture last time. This is another example of a frog that has gone through a color mutation. Now, it's not so much why is this frog blue, it's how did this frog become blue? It is blue because it has a color mutation known as a xanthism. Think of it like this. If you're mixing colors together, blue and yellow make green. The base layer of bullfrogs is actually blue, but this frog lacks a yellow pigmentation in its skin. If the base is blue and the second layer is yellow, when those mix together, that is why we perceive frogs as being green. This frog has a lack of that yellow pigmentation, which is what makes it appear to be sapphire. Now, a color abnormality like this can be rather frequent in nature, and it happens quite often in different amphibian species, not only in frogs, but also in salamanders. Although scientists predict that finding a blue bullfrog is about one in 30,000 frogs. So I definitely consider this quite the anomaly and a pretty incredible find. Now, the reason that I'm guessing that there is genetic mutation happening here on Middle Bass Island is because this is a very isolated population of bullfrogs. There are very few predators other than herons and snapping turtles in this environment, which is allowing these frogs to just continuously reproduce. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bullfrogs living in this marsh. So after a while, it's not unlikely that there's going to be some sort of mutation that happens where you have a color variation like this. I think we all remember the sapphire crayfish and I think it would be uh, rather fitting to call this the sapphire bullfrog but just so we're clear this is not a new species. It is a true bullfrog it just has a color mutation. Uh, the more this frog is out in the sun warming itself up for the day the brighter that blue color is going to get. When this amphibian is cold or it's hunkered down they have the ability to shift the chromatophores in their skin which of course can help keep them more camouflaged. 
Now the problem a blue frog like this faces is that it cannot camouflage properly. I'm actually really pleased to see that the frog has grown to this size to begin with. A lot of animals that do not have the proper coloration for their environment end up being easily predated upon by other predators. Now, the way that I caught this frog, which actually happened off camera, is I did shine it with a flashlight, but it wasn't in the water, it was actually up on land. I used the long extendable net, got the net over top of the frog, it was able to quickly pounce on top of it and get it scooped up. What I want to do now is give you guys an up close comparison between the blue bullfrog and a normal green bullfrog. Now, these are the exact same species, about the same size, but you'll notice how different looking the blue mutation is from the green one. Let's start with the eyes. The eyes of the green bullfrog are bright amber in coloration surrounding that black pupil, but the blue bullfrog's eyes are almost completely black and brown. That again has to do with the lack of yellow pigmentation in this frog's body. When it comes to camouflage, there's no question about it. The green frog is gonna blend in much better within a swamp or marsh environment with lily pads and duckweed. The blue bullfrog, especially when you turn it sideways like this, you can see is so much more likely to stand out amongst a green environment. My theory on that as to why I was unable to catch the blue bullfrog last time is that they're more agile and more in tune with any movements within the environment. The second they feel the water shifting or a difference between light and shadows, they immediately think, oh no, I'm no longer hidden, something's getting close, it may eat me, I better spring off into action and find myself a better hiding spot. I wonder if they're talking, saying to themselves, what are we doing right now? Are we being filmed? Were we abducted by aliens? Are we about to be famous on YouTube? Without question, this blue bullfrog is probably going to be the most famous frog we have ever filmed. Well, it's taken me several trips back to Middle Bass Island, but I was finally able to find and successfully catch the one and only blue bullfrog. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, time to get these two hoppers back off into the swamp. A quick search of the internet will reveal that several blue frogs have shown up in 2020, including specimens sighted in Texas, Indiana, Louisiana, Iowa, and of course, Ohio. Some say these frogs are one in a million, which is probably pretty accurate considering the number of tadpoles that hatch out and grow into frogs every season. Yet while it is rarely witnessed due to the elusive nature of most amphibians, azanathism is relatively widespread in salamander and frog populations that have a limited gene pool, like frogs isolated to an island. For me, the summer of 2020 will always carry with it the memory of the blue frog. And if you ever get the chance to visit Middle Bass Island and find yourself walking along the marsh, who knows, maybe you too will be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the sapphire bullfrog. There's a famous song that goes, country roads take me home to the place I belong, West Virginia. And on this adventure, we will be following an old gravel country road that will hopefully take us to the place that one very rare creature calls home. This is West Virginia. First time I have ever filmed in this state. Many creatures we can come across. Now it's just a matter of taking this gravel path further into the wilderness and then we'll break trail into the underbrush and see what we can find. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Today we are working alongside field herpetologist Tim Brust, who has spent many summers researching the various creatures that call this wild and wonderful state home. And while he specializes in reptiles and amphibians, today we are after one incredibly elusive crustacean that for now, we will simply call the blue crayfish. Well, this is cool. We have a little stream system that is moving right through the middle of the forest. This is actually a great place to look for small woodland frogs and salamanders. Look at this. Most of the time you imagine crayfish living in streams and rivers. However, the species we are searching for today is a variety of burrowing crayfish that lives underground. They can be found in areas known as seeps, which are defined as a wet place where groundwater reaches the Earth's surface from an underground aquifer. Similar to the fully aquatic crayfish species, the burrowing crayfish also hides under rocks. So it was just a matter of flipping the right one. So Tim, this is what's considered seepage. Here, Mark, take a look at this. 
see all this water here just in this low spot? Yeah. This is actually seeping out from the hillsides, right? Yep. So Tim tells me that this rock right here is a great example of something we should flip that may have a crayfish underneath. And I can see this is all real moist right here. You see all this water? It looks like we're just on leaves, but you peel the leaves back and you've got water. So there could actually be a crayfish under this rock. Oh, there's a lot of water there. I guess I just put my hand in there and see if there's anything in it. Oh, there's definitely a burrow right there. Oh, but no crayfish. All right, let's keep going. From rock to rock, we searched, gently flipping each one and placing it right back in the exact same spot so that we did not alter the design of the environment. Oh, jeez. Whoa, what is that? That's a huge slimy salamander. Oh, we need a slippery. Oh, come here. Got it, got it. I got it, yes. Wow, that is an enormous slimy salamander. That's probably the biggest one I have ever seen. Now they're called slimy salamanders because ugh, they excrete a slime from their skin. It's almost like a slug. It is very, very sticky. Let me turn you like this. You gonna sit up on my fingers there? Wow, that is a giant salamander. Much bigger than the salamanders that we catch in Ohio. And look at that cool patterning. Almost looks like the spots of a spotted salamander. Now this is a lungless salamander species. They actually breathe through their skin. So I don't wanna handle it for too long. You can see I'm trying not to actually handle it, like grasp onto it because I don't wanna take moisture from its skin. But just handling it a tiny bit and my fingers are extremely sticky. Now one cool thing about salamanders is that they can actually, well most varieties, can detach their tails. It's called caudal autonomy the same thing that lizards are capable of doing and that helps them escape from predators and then that tail will rejuvenate itself. Well, what a great find. It's not a blue crayfish, but still pretty cool to get this salamander up close for the cameras. All right, I'm gonna dip it in water, place it back under the rock, and we'll keep searching. Sound good? Great start. All right, here we go. Yeah, here, come here, check this out. Oh, come on. Oh, I got one. Do you? I got one. one. Oh. Yes, but it's not blue. It's a crayfish, but it's not blue. Yeah, let's try down and take a look. Oh, he's rearing up with those claws. Look at that. Ah, 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 oh man, every time. Yep, yeah, he's just holding on with those pinchers. Oh, the next pincher's about to pinch me too. All right, little buddy, I appreciate that. Can you uh, call ahead to some of your cousins who are blue? That's what we're really looking for. I knew I was gonna get pinched. Oh. Man, it's one cool little crustacean though. A little fossorial crayfish. All right, back under the rock with this crayfish. And we're gonna continue searching. You can flip rocks for hours and come across nothing, but that's what makes it fun because there's always going to be another rock. And all it takes is flipping the right rock to uncover a jewel of the wilderness. I'm telling you guys, you're not gonna believe how blue this little animal is until you actually see it. Actually, this rock right here, before we walk past it, looks perfect. But that's a huge rock. I think you could do it. Muscles, come on. Oh man, I don't think I can. You've been hitting the gym. I don't think I can lift that one. That's a two-hander. That's a weird beetle. You can see it and see if it's possible. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be a whopper. Let's do it. That's a big rock right there. All right, here we go. I'm gonna lift it, you ready? One, two, three. Oh. I got one, I got one. Holy oh mackerel. There it is. Whoa. That is a blue crayfish. I told you to go for that rock. <laughs> Heavy rock and it paid off with a blue crayfish. Look at that thing. Okay, I'm gonna leave this rock positioned just like this. Okay, let's come over here. Let's back up to the trail. Wow. Yeah, this is good, this is good. Look at that. Can you believe how blue that crayfish is? Hold on, I'm gonna turn it like this and kind of hold it by its tail. There it is, the sapphire of the West Virginia hillsides. It is so blue, I can't believe it. It is as blue as the sky is. Look at that crustacean. Wow. That must be the coolest looking crayfish I have ever seen. Now, this is a species that is subterranean, which means that they have burrows that can go down as deep as eight feet under the ground, and they will come up into those little pools of water underneath the rocks to search for food. Now these crayfish do not grow to be very large. This is about average size and it is a female and the way that I can tell that is by looking at its underside 
It does not have these little kind of grappling legs underneath there where if it was a male, it would use to grasp onto a female. And I can also tell that this one has a regenerated claw. If you didn't know this, most crustaceans, especially crayfish, are capable of losing claws and then they regenerate them. So this claw right here is a little bit smaller than that claw. So at some point, a predator likely tried to eat it, it dropped its claw and then it managed to escape. And now that claw is growing back. So I heard that these crayfish, they can actually drown in water. So you'd, if you found one of these, you wouldn't want to release it in the stream. No, they go in water. Their burrows oftentimes are filled with water, but they have to keep coming to the surface to breathe. Now they do have gills, just like aquatic crayfish, but those gills allow them to breathe air. So you may be wondering to yourself, Coyote, don't you need to put this thing back into the water? Is it gonna suffocate by being out in the open air? No, not at all. This crayfish is breathing right now. So Coyote, we actually need to get some data while we're out here, correct? That's right. It is possible that this is a new subspecies of this crayfish. Now, there are two recognized species, and it is possible that this one could be a third. So what we're going to do is take some really detailed photographs and mark the GPS coordinates, and you never know, this may be a completely newly discovered crayfish. How cool would that be? That would be awesome. Do you think they'll let us name it? Maybe, and if we were able to name it, I would call it the sapphire crayfish because in my opinion, this is a lost jewel here in the hillsides of West Virginia. Coyote Pack, what do you guys think? The sapphire crayfish? I like it. Well, I would say it was a pretty epic adventure today. We flipped over many rocks, we found salamanders, we found a brown crayfish, and then of course, the last largest rock revealed to us this little blue beauty. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. The blue crayfish is one of the most uniquely colored animals we have ever come across. Its elusive nature and subterranean dwelling made it difficult to find, but in the end, the long search was completely worth it. As of the release of this episode, this subspecies of crayfish has officially been classified as a new discovery and is in the process of being described by scientists. And when it comes to the common name officially becoming the sapphire crayfish, well, that's still up for debate and we are told there is a chance it may actually happen. So I'll continue to keep my fingers crossed. The Costa Rican rainforest is considered to be one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Home to literally thousands of species, the crew and I have been fortunate enough to encounter some of its most iconic animals, from the striking red-eye leaf frog to the adorable ocelot. Now she has found the microphone. Oh. No, no. When exploring in Central America, one of our favorite places to visit is the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve, which is famous for having some incredibly rare and almost never seen creatures. Mark, Mark, come here! What is it? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! What do you got? You are not gonna believe this. Oh my gosh. And while I have been present for nearly all of these initial finds, every once in a while, Mark and Mario stumble upon an animal without me. And on this rainy evening, they just so happen to encounter what may be considered the rarest animal we have ever found in the rainforest. Mario! Back yeah. Come look what I found. What? What'd you get? I've got a giant ornithopra, the what? rare one. Oh man. Right here on this rock. This is the one that's on the wall in the cabin. Yeah, that totally is. We, what do we do? Um, Coyote's not even here. What do we do? We just film it? Uh, well, certainly we have to film it. I've got a container in my backpack. Um, we could contain it, take it back to the lodge, have Coyote check it out, and uh, we get some great B-roll shots. All right, we have to, right? Yeah. We have to. We'll, oh, yeah. we'll bring it back. Yeah, we'll bring it right back after, and uh, that'll be awesome. Dude. Great find, dude. Wow. Okay, so. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Let's be gentle. Careful, careful. Be careful. You know, those things can spray stuff. Ooh. It was very velvety. Hold on, I got to touch it. Let me see. Oh, it's so cool. All right, yeah? let's go. I'm so excited. Right, let's I, do can, it. I can hardly stand still. Let's go. Secured. Yes. Woo. Peyote. Peyote. You guys find anything cool to photograph? Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Show. Check out what Mark found. Show. Get out of here. 
We found You were kidding me! We found it on the rock, like four paces where we found the brown one. Yeah. Get out of here, I cannot believe that. Go inside and get the get the picture, show everybody. So, oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> I cannot believe you guys found the holy grail! Oh my goodness, guys, they found <laughs> Good, 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 you know, that, that's what we were looking for, <laughs> that reaction. Get out of town! We, we've been, we've been just like jumping for joy the whole way home. Look at it, yep, there it is. So we brought it back, uh, what we want to do is we want to build a little film set. Ooh, that's a great idea. Oh, you know what we should do? Like a planet Earth type shoot where we set yes. it up on a little table. I've got the little table up here. We'll get some moss, get some logs, set it up and do a presentation. Absolutely. This will kind of be like the mole cricket episode only with a much rarer animal. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you found it. Holy bro, this is insane. So wait, who found it? You found it? Yeah, I, I mean, we, dude, yeah. we just filmed the people. <sighs> yeah. Woo, this is crazy. Not a bad gig, Coyote, when you can do your job and wear sandals. I do. I got my sandals on. I don't even have my snake boots. I mean, I was working on the Orca script and uh, just kind of lounging. I saw the rain start to come down. I was like, man, these guys better hurry back before those cameras get soaked. Let me see if I can get it to just stay totally calm on my hand. Whoa, you are looking at the velvet worm quite possibly the rarest creature you can come across in the Costa Rican rainforest. This creature's ancestors date back 500 million years to the Cambrian period. That is before the time of the dinosaurs. Now, this was one of the first terrestrial creatures to ever walk this planet. And even to this day, they are strictly terrestrial, which means that they stay on land. Now, let's talk about where this animal gets its name from the velvet worm. Believe it or not, this creature feels just like velvet. It does not have any hard outer exoskeleton like an arthropod, but in fact has a very soft, squishy body. Almost feels like a gummy worm. But if you pet it very gently, go ahead, Mark, put your hand out there, tell everybody at home, feels just like velvet. Oh, wow. Yeah, so like, like soft. it crushes all the suit. So soft. Yeah, it's so cool. Here's something really cool. They are actually capable of shedding the outer layer of skin around once a month, just like a snake. And when they do shed that, they basically walk out of the skin, similar to the way a snake slithers out of its skin, and then they're even softer and more brilliantly bright. Oh, it's so cool. Let's take a look at the anatomy of this animal. Now, it looks like a mix between a caterpillar, a worm, and a slug but onycophron is actually its own phylum, right? And there are close to 200 of them worldwide. However, scientists don't even know how many truly exist because they are very rarely seen. This is a nocturnal creature, and the fact that, Mark, you and Mario just stumbled upon it tonight is why they're so hard to find, because oftentimes they're out on rainy nights when most people aren't out venturing around. Now, despite the fact that this creature is actually kind of cute, Believe it or not, it is a voracious predator. And the way that they hunt is they slowly move through the rainforest floor, forging amongst leaves and dead logs, and they'll use those two front sensory organs to kind of tap on their prey. And as soon as they sense something to eat, this is crazy. They have two glands on the side of their face that shoot out a sticky slime. It's like Spider-Man's webbing, right? And it is so incredibly strong that it can immediately pin the prey down. It actually shoots out in two streams and those streams will cross creating a net. So let's say it's a small beetle. It will go shoot out those two streams, tangle up the beetle, and then slowly walk up on top of it. And they have a little mouth up front. I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not, but inside that mouth is a single tooth that is like a razor blade. They insert that tooth into their victim, and then they leak in saliva. That saliva is similar to the saliva of a giant water bug, and it slowly breaks down the insides of their prey, and they drink it up just like a milkshake. Are you afraid of being bit right now? No, its tooth is much too small to potentially bite me, and they're not aggressive in any way whatsoever. It's not like a centipede or a water bug. This is something that is completely safe to handle. However, it's incredibly fragile. So as you can see, I'm trying to be just as careful as possible. I also don't want it to shoot me with that sticky slime because it's just like glue. Now, is it toxic, the slime? Does it, does it like poison you or what as, does it do? As far as I know, everything I've read, no. The slime is completely 
harmless. So if it does get slime on me, I'm gonna be absolutely fine. Now, each one of those little stub feet has two little hooked claws. They almost look like cat's claws, and they use those to hold on to rigid surfaces when they're moving over, like, let's say, a log or a dry branch. However, if they're walking on something moist and soft, like moss, those claws retract in, and they have these little tiny soft pads on the ends of their feet. I can actually feel it gripping onto my hand, and it doesn't hurt at all, but it feels really interesting because those legs on each side move in unison with one another. And just like a worm, and remember, this is not related to a worm, but like a worm, it has a very soft body, and it's the expanding and contraction of the muscles inside of its body that allow it to get longer if it needs to. So like, let's say it's moving through some crevices in a log, it can stretch its body out and get itself completely out of a sticky situation. Oh, hi there, buddy. I see you. And look at the strength of its body. It can completely extend itself out just like we've seen millipedes do in the past, searching for the next move to make. And there it goes, right up on my fingers. Wow. Lucky night in the rainforest. Man, that thing is so cool. All right, well, you built a pretty awesome little set here, Coyote. Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for us to get this velvet worm down on the miniature set and start filming some epic B-roll. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's get the voiceover going and turn this into a Planet Earth episode. The red velvet worm is a creature that is almost never seen in the wild with human eyes. Their elusive nature and nocturnal lifestyle, combined with their tendency to exist in only remote areas of the rainforest, make encountering them nearly impossible. To our knowledge, we are one of the only teams to have ever captured video footage of this animal. So having this opportunity was truly a once in a lifetime. This lucky moment will now be held near the top of our greatest memories we as animal enthusiasts will forever carry with us. And we are incredibly proud that we have now been able to share this encounter with each and every one of you. What an absolutely incredible night, getting the holy grail of bizarre rainforest creatures, the red velvet worm, up close for the cameras. I'm Coyote Peterson, be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right guys, here we are, back at the rock where we found this amazing rainforest creature the Ornicophora. By far the coolest animal I've ever found. The coyote was pretty impressed. And jealous. Yeah, maybe a little jealous. But man, we had a great night. All right, buddy. Right back where we found you, just like we promised. Do you guys want to see something really scary? No. Yes, you do. Come on, let's go down to the river. <laughs> I don't know if this is such a good idea. Oh, I'm about to show you guys the scariest thing you have ever seen. I've been thinking about this all day. I found one earlier, but at night, it'd be a whole lot better. So where are you really taking us? To the river. What? You know, rivers at night can be really pretty scary. So what we're gonna do is go all the way through the deep dark woods and down to the river. Let's find some creatures. <laughs> Ooh. What do you see? Eyeballs. Where? You see that way out there? Where? <gasps> Those are eyes. Let me see if I can see that on camera. What is that? Mario, what is that? Oh, I can't see him on camera. Mario, what? wildlife biologist, identify, identify. Those are eyes, guys. Uh, well, the most logical oh. thing is a deer, but we are in Bigfoot territory. It could be a Sasquatch. Come on, let's go that way. We're being watched, guys. We're being watched. Mario. We're being watched. I can see the eyes. Oh, man, there's like a creepy old shed out here. Yep. You don't want to go in the shed. I think we've seen too many horror movies to know how these all begin. It kind of feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah, an old rusty shed. An old shed in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia. 
This never ends well for the people that go out with cameras and flashlights, does it? Yeah. See all this moisture in the grass? This means that they're going to be out and about tonight. They? It's a really good sign, yes. Sure. There's more than one? There will definitely be more than one. But all it's going to take is one to find out how bad the bite is. What was that? Did you hear that? No, not your foot. Oh. It sounded like rocks knocking together. What does that mean? That's actually a definitive sign of a Sasquatch calling. But that's not what we're after tonight. The odds of us seeing Bigfoot, slim to none. If we do see one, we're gonna film it. But we wanna get to the river, and I can hear it from here. Come on, just over this ridge. Ooh, this is creepy. It's like a beach. There's the water. I thought I heard something, sorry. I saw all kinds of reflective eyes. All right, I need a big flat rock. To defend ourselves with? No. To look under. Uh -oh. Not there. OK, let's venture up this way a little bit. No, nothing. Oh. It's a Helgramite. Oh, mackerel. That's a big one, too. Whew. Wow. All right, guys. Well, if you remember an Instagram post I made a few weeks ago of a creature that looks. Ah! It's biting me. Okay, they do bite. There you have it. Everybody want to know do they bite? Yes, they do bite. It is latched onto my finger right now. Oh, that hurts. But. It's not breaking skin. That's, uh, oh, ah. Ooh, it's got a hold of me. Now, the Helgramite, can you see it okay there? Oh, yeah. It's got a hold of me. The Helgramite is actually the larva stage of the Dobson fly. Now, the Dobson fly, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, well, is that maybe some beautiful butterfly type creature? No, it's about as wicked looking as this thing is, only with big wings and enormous front mandibles. However, those mandibles aren't strong enough to pinch and bite onto anything like the larva stage. Now, I'm gonna turn it slightly like this. Wow. Oh, it is just latched. Now, if the bite isn't enough, what they will also do to deter a predator is squirt a nasty smelling musk from their rear end. And it actually smells just like human feces. And Ew, what? It smells oh, like, it smells like. Oh, like poop. Exactly like poop. Ugh. And it is already squirted musk all over my finger. Oh, it absolutely stinks. Ah, 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 ah. Biting on harder. That is about the most alien looking creature I think I have ever come across. Like something out of the show Stranger Things. Ugh. Okay, it's been latched onto my finger for a while now, and what I'm gonna do is just gently dip it into the water. Now they are semi-aquatic, so putting in the water isn't gonna cause any issues, but I do wanna get it off of my finger. All right, here, try this. I'm just gonna set it down gently. So just like I get crayfish off of me. Oh, he's not letting go. Let go. Ow! Oh, it's biting out harder. Ow! There it goes. Got it. Okay. Ah! Oh, bit me again! Man. Ah, there we go. Can't catch a break. Okay. Now let's take a good look at the anatomy of this creature. Look at that underside. Wow, that is gnarly. This is like a mix between a scorpion, a centipede, a water bug, and a tremor. Wait, look at its mouth. That was on your finger. Yeah, those front mandibles right there, can you see that? Those were latched onto my finger. Yes. And these two back appendages there have hooks on them, just like the rear hooks on a centipede. Ooh. See that, how they move backwards? Ow! No! Ah, 
Ah, he's got me right underneath the fingernail. I'm gonna hold him there, though. All right, now he's hooked on to me. Oh, there, let go. There, look at that. Oh, wow, that is so bizarre. I don't know how you're leaving this Ow, oh, it's like an alien. Ah! Oh, it has all these little hooks on its arms. Just the way it moves. Ugh. It like slinks. What did I tell you? It's like a night, a living nightmare. Look at that. Oh, it's hooked on to me. Oh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Can you imagine what it would be like to have one of these things crawl into your ear? It's gonna eat your brain. Ugh. No, 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 no. Ow! Ah! Ah! Oh, that actually really hurts. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Looks pretty good, dude. I think it's actually poked a hole in my ear. Ah! Ow! What do you guys think? Helgamite earrings? Could this be the new look? <laughs> no. Is it dangling down from my ear? Oh, yeah. Ah! Here, can you tur turn to the... Oh, my gosh. Hold on, hold it there. What if it went in your brain? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I got to get it off my ear. Ugh. Now... Oh! Ooh! Wow, your ears are a lot softer than your finger. Mm, that hurts. So at this point, I pretty much just have to wait for it to drop off on its own. So you can't just take it off? Well, if I touch it or pull on it, it's going to just bite down harder. All right, let's, uh, do you want me to try to get it off? Uh, let me see. Ooh. Ow! Oh, let's see it. Trim your ear. Oh, wow, yeah. Is it bleeding? It's got a good crease. There's a little white speck. Ouch. Well. I would say that this, without question, is the creepiest looking creature that we have come across here in West Virginia. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. <laughs> Stay wild. We'll see you on the next location. All right, back under your rock, little creeper. Oftentimes, we fear things that have a creepy and alien looking appearance. Even I'll admit, the moment I found my first Helgramite, I was incredibly nervous to pick it up, especially with that set of intimidating mandibles. However, in the end, I think what we all learned is that while this creature may look intimidating, it's non-venomous, and its bark is far worse than its bite. Do you know what's creepier than one Helgermite? 25 Helgermites. <laughs> what's that for? Well, what Mark doesn't know is that earlier today, when I was down by the river and I found the first Helgramite, I also found 25 of them. And I'm gonna make Mark put his hand in this bowl full of them. Hey, Mark. Really? Well, that's cool. So you know how early we started this and I was like, hey, you know what I found today? Mm -hmm. Something really gross. Yeah, I know the Helgramites. Yeah, the Helgramite, right? And that was super gross. Well, I kind of didn't tell you the whole truth. Okay. I found one Helgramite. And then I kept flipping over rocks, and I found 25 Helgramites. Dude. <laughs> so what I challenge you to do right now, oh my gosh, you really did, is put your hand into this bowl and see if you get bitten by Helgramite. No, no, no. Yeah, come no, on. No. I got Guys, stung by a bullet on. ant. Come on. I was stung by a bullet ant. And I just want you to put your hand in there for 60 seconds. 60 seconds? Yeah, you guys always tell me, can you last for 60 seconds? Can you last for 60 seconds with your hand in a bowl of Helgramites? Ooh. I'll count it down for you, ready? Wait, who signed me up for this? I didn't agree to this. No, well, you know, Mario and I were kind of like, you know it would be really fun? Getting Mark finally bitten by something. <laughs> and it's not that bad. I was even bitten on the ear and it didn't break skin. One, two, three. There's 25 yeah, there's of them. There's definitely 25 in there. That's so gross. Okay, so you, you know what the line is, right? Uh, no, I don't. What is the you line? You gotta say your name, <laughs> and I'm about to enter the bite zone with the Helgramite. And then you gotta just place one of your hands in there and let them crawl all over you for 60 seconds. I don't know, man. I'm, do you sure you don't want me to film this? Mario, come on. No, 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 <laughs> put you here. Give me your camera. All right, you're gonna, take... fil you're gonna film it? I'm not gonna film it, just so you don't drop your camera right, in case you get bitten. Just put it there. Yeah, let, let's get it, let's get ourselves situated. Get on the ground. We'll have a little setup, and we're gonna do this just like a normal scene here. All right. I did find a centipede. Did you? Yeah, let's go. Oh, uh, we don't care that you found a millipede. We care about you getting bitten by Helgramites. Do you have a good shot? Yeah. 
was kind of hoping you'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right, Coyote Pack. Mark is going to do it. Okay. Director of Breaking Trail is going to enter the bite zone. Okay. I'm Director Mark, and I'm about to enter the bite zone with 25 helmets. All right. I can't watch this. Put your hand in there. Come on. One, two, three. It's so creepy. All up on you there. Oh, oh they're pooping on you. Ah, just got bit. Oh, oh no. Oh, there's another one. Oh, God. Keep your hand oh. in there. Keep your hand in there. Oh, All the way in the bowl. Oh. All the way in the bowl. Oh. That's about 30 oh, seconds. That's another bite. Oh, oh there's another bite. See my finger. Oh, yeah, that's oh, right. Oh, there's another bite. <laughs> oh, they're biting me. Dude. Ah. Three. Two. It actually does hurt. One. All right, let him out. Ah. Oh, oh, hold on. Hold. Oh, look at that. It's latched onto him. Let me get it. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Now smell oh, your hand. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Mario, smell my hand. Oh, <laughs> well, there you oh. had it. Good job, buddy. I'll give you a stinky oh, high five. I'm like, I'm like shaking, man. That's it like, hurts that's... a little bit, right? No, it's just super, super creepy. <laughs> I saw that one really got the yeah. side of your finger pretty good. Oh, they're biting me. Oh, man. Well, well, we're gonna let all these little hologramites go back off into the wild, and they're going to metamorphosize into Dobson flies. And then they're gonna be flying everywhere. Absolutely. Ugh. I think right. I just got some of that in my eye. Ugh. All right, guys, I gotta wash my hands. Yeah. <laughs> there they go. Look at them go. As the rumble of thunder echoed through the mountains, and flashes of lightning illuminated the sky, heavy rains poured down, saturating the wilds of South Africa. Tonight we are hunkered down at the Tainskloof Game Reserve, waiting for the storm to pass. When it does, the life-giving rains will have brought one mysterious creature out from hiding. Creepy, crawly, and completely harmless, this native arthropod definitely deserves a moment in the spotlight. Oh, Woo. he's awake. You guys got a lot of lights out here. It's a little late for lights, isn't it? No, it's the perfect time. Or you guys want to go searching for creatures? Oh, yeah. Well, the good news is that we're on location right now in South Africa, staying at the Reserve Protection Agency's headquarters. And earlier today, some rain moved through, which means that the animals are going to be moving about. Yes. Now, I heard a rumor that there's a little creepy crawly that may be out tonight called the Shongololo. Oh, the sh the sh what? The Shongololo. Sounds crazy, right? Could be creepy, could be crawly, and if you guys are ready, get the flashlights on. See if we can get one up close for the cameras. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right, here we go. All right, let's venture out from under the overhang and into the mist. Can you see that mist coming down? Yeah, I can. I know, it looks like we're in Costa Rica right now, not South Africa. And here you go, if you crouch down, point your camera at the ground, bring the lights down here, you'll notice how much moisture is in this grass. And we're in the dry season right now. And what's crazy is that I think we brought the rain from Ohio. I was expecting arid terrain and lizards and reptiles all over the place. And so far, we've been wet this entire trip. Over here, we've got a rock structure. All those little nooks and crevices are the perfect place to find the myriapod that I'm after tonight. You guys ready? Let's do it. Let's go search. All these crevices are the perfect place to look. You see all this moisture just spilling down the rock sides. We're looking for the Shunga, what's it, Shongololo. what is it again? Shongololo. And how do you spell that? S-H-O-N-G-O-L-O-L-O. -O -O. Shongololo. Wow, I'm actually impressed. Oh, right here, right here. That didn't take us long. Now you may be looking at that thinking to yourself, that's a millipede. Shongololo is the indigenous name here in South Africa for the millipede. Now this is a big black one. Come here, buddy. I'm gonna pick it up very gently. Buddy, look at that guy. Now, there are several different species in this area and this is actually not the one that we are looking for. This one is just completely black in coloration. It actually looks a lot like the millipede that we found in Arizona. It does a bit. Now there are 8,000 species of millipede worldwide. And the ones here in South Africa are bigger and in many instances more brightly colored. Now, 
I'm gonna place this one back. This is, you may be thinking, man, that's a big millipede. Why don't we film that one? Trust me, guys, when you see the millipede that I'm after, it is much more impressive looking. All right, I'm gonna place this one back down on his rock. You ready? Yep. All right, little buddy. Let's check this plant structure as well. Good place for snakes, maybe some frogs. Oh, Shongololo! Got one? Two of them! You got two? This is the one we're looking for, the red and black millipede. Can you guys see it? Oh yeah, man, that's awesome. Got one here and one right down there. Wow, they're about equal size. They are big, but this is exactly the species that we were looking for. Now, I'm gonna gently take one of these off the tree. Let's take it under an overhang and get up close for the camera. Sound good? Sounds good, yeah, we should get out of this rain. It's starting to really come down. I wanna be very gentle with this. And got it. Wow, it really is red. Oh yeah, and unlike the centipede, I don't have to worry about being bitten by this creature. Okay, let's go up here under the overhang and get it up close for the cameras. Okay. Well, that certainly didn't take us too long. There you have it, the red and black millipede one of the most iconic millipede species that you can find here in South Africa. Now this one's pretty good size. They do get a bit bigger than this, but for getting one in front of the cameras, this certainly will work. Now I'm free handling this millipede and this is completely safe. Unlike centipedes, they do not bite, so I have nothing to worry about here. Now, similar to insects and arachnids, they are arthropods, but both centipedes and millipedes are part of a superclass known as myriapods. To some species, they are considered toxic. However, to humans, if you eat one of these, you're gonna get sick, but it's not gonna kill you. Not that I can imagine you'd ever want to eat a millipede. Now, the millipede is the perfect little recycling creature in nature. And what they're doing is breaking down all the decomposing plant matter that you'll find out there on the forest floor, whether it be leaves, mushrooms or anything else that's decomposing, honestly, sometimes even dead animals, they will help break that down and return it to the ecosystem. Now, the way that these creatures breathe is through a series of small holes that run along the side of the body called spiracles. And they are very, very fragile considering the fact that they have this rigid exoskeleton. If it gets too hot, so if this creature finds itself out during the daylight, it can actually cook from the inside out. It's also very susceptible to water. So if it gets into an area where too much rainfall comes down, they drown very easily. So while it may be prehistoric looking in nature and it's been here for millions of years, it's actually pretty fragile when you when you break it all down. Now here's something that's cool, and the reason I wanted to feature this millipede is because it is red and black. And that red coloration, as you guys know, my favorite saying, aposomatic coloration, is a warning to any potential predator that I may be toxic. I'm not sure exactly how toxic this variety is, but given that coloration, I'm willing to bet that it is not something that you want to chomp down on. Now the name millipede means a thousand legs. However, there's no millipede species in the world that actually has a thousand legs. In fact, the millipede with the most number of legs counts around 400. Do we want to take the time to count this millipede's legs? Um, I don't think so, but <laughs> if I hold it up like this and show you its underside, you can see that each individual segment has two pairs of legs. As this creature grows, each section grows every time it sheds its exoskeleton. So if you're out there walking through the underbrush and you see a millipede and it looks like it's completely white, that's actually not a dead millipede, but an exoskeleton that was left behind after a shedding. That's so cool, the way that they move. Just a wave at a time with those legs. Now you see those two little antenna-like structure up front? Those are actually sensory organs that help them explore their environment. Those help it find its food and also can detect potential predators. So why do they come out in so many numbers? Well, it's called a drove when they come out. So when the rain comes in, it moistens up the soil and they come out from underneath the leaf litter. And what they're doing right now, because everything is moist, is they're getting the opportunity to feed, their opportunity to lay eggs, and their opportunity to do what they do, which is break down the environment. Now they do have little mouth parts, so Unlike a centipede, they don't have those big front pinching mandibles that can inject venom, but those little mouth parts are used to break down their food. They don't have proper eyes, but they do have eyes that are capable of sensing light. So as the daylight creeps in, they begin to realize, okay, I better tuck back down underneath a log or rock so that I don't end up getting cooked. Now, you know, they don't move very fast, Coyote, but they actually can cover some ground. 
They really can. And you can see that about four or five sets of legs move at a time, almost like a wave type motion. And if they need to escape from something quickly, they can move up to 20 sets of those legs at one time. But in this instance, it feels pretty calm. It's just trying to sense the environment by feeling my hand and see it's, it's looking for its next point of purchase. There you go. As long as I just keep placing my hands out in front of the millipede, it will have something else to walk onto. Well, it certainly didn't take much searching for us to get the red and black millipede, also known as the Shongololo, up close for the cameras. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next location. Hey, you're gonna let him go, right? Oh, that's right. I gotta place him back out there on his rock. South Africa is home to some of the world's largest and most iconic animals, including giraffes, elephants, and rhinos. Yet oftentimes it's the smaller creatures, such as the Shangalolo, that manage to go uncelebrated. So while they are creepy looking, without question crawly, and likely to give you a scare if you just stumble upon one, these harmless and beautifully colored millipedes are certainly a sight to see. And the good news is that if you do see one, it means that the much needed rains have likely returned to bless Africa.